Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of Debate Night. We got a great episode tonight, a lot of fun topics, and we got a new guest uh, analyst today. Before we get into that, we got to get uh, give a thanks to today's sponsor, Manscaped. Today, we're here to celebrate the perfect summer grooming companion that'll keep you looking cool even when it's sizzling outside. I'm excited to announce the new Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra and the new colorway White Hot from Manscaped. You can step up your grooming game this summer with the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra in White Hot Experience precision like never before with next gen dual skin safe blade heads and updated trimmer blade and interchangeable foil blade for peak performance these updated blades are not just for show they're designed to keep you looking smooth and sleek under the summer sun first the updated trimmer blade features longer wider and rounded teeth that cut through hair with ease and here's where things get interesting the foil blade crafted to transcend the boundaries of your typical trim achieved with the trimmer blade this foil blade is designed to leave you with a finish that is irresistibly sleek and utterly bare it glides gently over your skin, capturing even, even the finest hairs for a flawless look that's ready to impress. So if you want to check out all this from Manscaped, uh, you can join the 10 million men worldwide who already trust them for their grooming needs, and you can get the Lawn Mower 5.0 Ultra in the white hot at manscaped.com. You can get 20% off plus free shipping with code debate night. That's 20% off plus free shipping with code debate night at manscaped.com. Thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring tonight's episode. Um, let's introduce our analyst for tonight. Um, Brody is here as always, man of the people. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a term that's been thrown around quite a bit on this show. Um, firstly, <laughs> I am the only one that has man of the people shirt merch. So true, there's true. that. Uh, also, I decided to give out uh, free MacBook Pros this week. What, <laughs> what's more, man, the people of that, uh, Hunter, you're welcome. You can get one of those. Um, I missed my opportunity. By the way, if you did get if you did get fooled that I that that if you thought that was me and not a hacker, that's on you. I have never <laughs> and will mm. never address everyone. Hello, Twitter family. Okay, that. <laughs> I don't know what's up with these hackers and their AI, but that was, I mean, that was clear as day that, that clearly that was not me. Uh, but going back to last week's episode, uh, we have pitch perfect with the, the most favorite or most liked comment saying Trevor turns into a teenage girl at the thought of AB watching him. Um, then we have understable Dave saying, can we please let all four panelists have their say before all interjecting from the host and two guys who had already had their say. Poor guys are just staring into the camera, possibly seeing their insights being debated into the ground before they even had a chance to mention them. So I know I'm a fault at this, so I will do my best to say my points and then wait until the very end for a <laughs> rebuttal. I think the last uh, episode had a few of those sticky topics where like we just couldn't let them go past and we definitely tough. got we definitely got caught on them a little bit. I, I, I'll, I'll concede that um, Hunter is here. He finally managed to reset his computer. Looking I good. did. I did. Um, yeah, I missed out on the deal of a lifetime with Brody's Twitter. I did get it on the Linus Tech Tip <laughs> deal of a lifetime, though. Twitter family. It was weird. They were offering the same thing, same wording, too. I don't know what's going on. They Damn worked it. so fast because I was actually going live. It was a terrible timing for me because I was literally going live when it happened. Um, and so I didn't know what was happening. And so when at the end, after I was done doing a live show, I checked my email and it was literally... Uh, someone signed in St. Petersburg, Russia, and that was at like <laughs> that was at like five fifty eight, and then like five fifty nine, someone changed your password. Six yep. o'clock, they gave, uh, they they changed they, they they turned off two step verification, which is crazy. How, why do I have two step verification if people can hack through it? Doesn't make any sense. Something then they, about. Then they turned it back on a minute later. <laughs> then they gave a next minute. They gave permission to Beatrice one two seven five eight. Who I'm guessing is the hacker to delegate stuff. And uh, then the next minute they changed my password. So literally they did all that in a matter of like three minutes. So hats off yeah. to them. They work pretty quick. Yeah, we've been there. And the one time it happened to us, we were in a meeting. And so by the time we got out of there, it was the same thing. It was like, Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> Whole string brutal. of unfortunate emails. Shout out to Elon day. too for, uh, yeah. for firing all your content, uh, content side of people. Cause now I just don't have a Twitter. No Twitter. Oh, you still just don't have a Twitter. You Dang. just you just send an email in now. Before, I mean, I had a contact there, but they got but fired. So yeah, yeah. So like Dang. before, you could just be like, "Hey, man, someone hacked my Twitter," and within five seconds, boom, you have your Twitter back. But all those people are gone now. So you just send an email saying, "Hey, my Twitter's hacked." Tough. And you and just wait, I guess. Dang. I don't know. Yeah. Shout shout That's out to tough. Elon. 
Um, we're also joined today. We got a new analyst today. Scott is joining us. Scott, tell me a little about yourself. How confident are you going in this episode? Hey, my name's Scott. I'm 24. I'm from Dallas, Texas. Uh, longtime listener. Excited to be here for my first time. Definitely a little nervous and just hoping I get uh, some points. That's yeah, the goal. Well, we'll see what happens. I, fun fact about Scott, uh, what hooked me uh, immediately was that he said he has won the Socrates Award for Whoa. debating in school. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. I literally, I had read that, um, but then I had to go back and like double check. Cause I was like, I'm pretty sure this guy said he won something called the Socrates award. And that's, I mean, that's impressive. So how hard was it to win yeah. that award? Uh, I was in a class called human letters where we pretty much read and discussed philosophy and the discussions had, you know, a Socratic format. We were all talking about stuff, beating off each other. And just at the end of the year, the, teacher selected the person who won so there i've always go. loved debating uh and yeah hopefully i can bring my a game for tonight scott right. i've read some literature that says that yelling in a debate is actually not good what are your thoughts on that uh i think that it's better to be heard and people hear you better when you talk to them calmly you know he escalate mm. the situation so people understand you. Ah, it's not a good debater. Good luck <laughs> it's not a good debater. <laughs> yeah, good luck de-escalating Brody. Uh, we'll see how that works. Uh, and then uh, we're also joined tonight by Lucas. Been a little while since Lucas has been on the show. Uh, busy guy, but he's back today looking for another win. Yeah, uh, I know you guys like your um, random tournament merch, so I'm repping my Belgian Turkey 19. Oh, yeah. I love it. Gotta have it. Thank you. If you guys want to look it up, it's a great <laughs> tournament in Chattanooga area. So, yeah. you know what, Hunter, we got to, we need to, I need to write this down. We need to do a grippy award for best local tournament name. Oh, and just Ooh. get them submitted. That's a great because one. Because people would, I'm sure we would hear some. I mean, yeah. I've, I've just, from the tournaments I've played, I've heard some that like you could hardly believe are real. Um, you need a best local trophy too, because yeah, some C tier trophies are uh, they're out there. I've gotten quite a few photos of some wild ones. Yeah, there is um the best one in my area was called. There was two that were great: the Crawl Dad Cooker and the Buck Miller Super Thriller. Uh, Heck, two of yeah. my favorites. I love that <laughs> Super Thriller. <laughs> so, yeah, Lucas, uh, were you sailing around the world? Where have you been? Um, no. So I graduated. That was the last time that I was on, like I had just graduated. And then, uh, my wife got accepted to medical school at ETSU, oh, which is like a couple hours away. So we just like moved up uh, to a different spot, got our first house and all that. So wow. really busy time actually. So you just yeah. seem like you have a boat. <laughs> 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 All right, fair enough. Um, well, let's hop into our first topic tonight. Um, I, I always love bringing up this argument. I, I may there's sometimes I know an argument's going to get a rise out of certain people, and I just have to bring it up uh, for that reason. But uh, the Olympic Games just wrapped up after a fun two weeks of international competition. Good time. Um, actually, got to watch a decent amount of Olympics this time around. I really made that a goal. Um, so my question here is: Would disc golf entering the Olympic Games have any sizable impact on our sport? And also, what would you say the likelihood of this happening is? Um, Brody, what do you think? Okay, so to answer the first question, it's so funny. I feel like every like niche sport is so enthralled. Like you would have no idea how many debates in Ultimate Frisbee people are talking about Ultimate being in the Olympics. I just feel like with every niche sport, everyone wants to get in the Olympics. I I understand it's it would be cool to like represent your country and and all that, but to be honest, like I don't think it actually would have that big of an impact. Um, there are tons of sports that just don't really get any sort of coverage at all. Now, could it turn into something like curling, for example, for me? Like, curling doesn't seem like it would be a sport that would attract a huge audience. But for whatever reason, when the Winter Olympics come around, I am so excited to, you know, wait up until 2 o'clock in the morning or whatever it was last time to watch curling. Uh, does that mean I'm going to go out and join a local curling club? No. But – do I get to have a little bit more information or Intel on curling? Yeah. I think that's the only issue is like, there's a lot of us that love watching the Olympics and that's the only time we'll ever watch a track and field event. So the, the thought that there would be a bunch of people that all of a sudden would start tuning into disc golf because of it, I don't think it's gonna have a huge sizable impact. 
And what's the likelihood? The Olympics, I've heard from years and years and years, have been losing money. So they've been looking at ways of not having a bunch of sports that can bring a whole lot of people. Uh, if disc golf is one of those where it's like only 10 countries are represented, then I see maybe it might have a shot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, Hey, break dancing is in there. Um, all right. Uh, Hunter, what do you think? What is your uh, take on disc golf at the Olympics? Yeah. So originally I was in the exact same camp as Brody where I'm like, I don't really, I think people think this is a much bigger deal than it would be, but I looked into what it did for skateboarding to try to open my mind a little bit. And it actually, opened my eyes to an angle I hadn't thought of before. So people in the skateboarding industry um, said like it definitely increased popularity a little bit. There was traffic to parks and website traffic and all the typical stuff that you're like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, none of them were like crazy, crazy numbers. Um, but a huge benefit they talked about that I had never thought of was le the legitimacy it gave to their sport when they were trying to get more skate parks in. Um, so I think being in the Olympics that helped skateboarding feel more legitimate and less like some of the, like outside, you know, rebellious sport. I think that's where the biggest benefit would come for disc golf. Um, cause we saw with COVID, right. That just because a lot of people get into the sport doesn't mean we're going to keep a lot of people in the sport. Um, and with a huge influx of money, sometimes disc golf companies don't know what to do with that money. And by sometimes I mean four years ago. So that doesn't necessarily mean the growth of the sport if there were some big influx, but I think it could really in, um, incentivize course installation all across the world and also motivate parks and rec departments to actually invest in the courses that are already in the grounds as they would help them see it as a legit sporting facility and not just something random they have to mow around. So I think from that side, it could actually have a pretty decent impact on our sport, just that it would be actually treated as a sport instead of just some, some type of a hobby. And I think it has an okay chance. Um, I think it's nothing, nothing crazy. I, I wouldn't surprise me if it happened in my lifetime. Okay. Yeah, that's actually, that is a very good point. Um, I definitely see that angle of, you know, anytime you can go to a representative and be like, Hey, this is an Olympic sport. Can we put in a course? That's a pretty big selling point. Um, because you know, they might not be analyzing the Olympic effect as much as we are. They're just kind of hearing that word. Um, Scott, what do you think about disc golf and its potential in the Olympic games? So I think entering the Olympic games would have a measurable impact on disc golf. Not only is there a huge increase in media coverage about the new sports, uh, you know, entering the Olympics, for example, rock climbing and skateboarding, the two most recent additions had hundreds of uh, articles by dozens of media companies written about them. There's also been a measurable impact on the prize purse in international sport climbing. So a uh, paper published in 2022 by Rago et al. found that participants understood that additional finances would provide athletes with more opportunities to skate and climb professionally. So being in the Olympics also comes with additional investors in the sport. The Olympic Committee itself can inv invest in it, uh, and it's going to make you more attractive to uh, other sponsors being in the Olympics. And in 2019, on the International Sport Climbing Competition, uh, a first place win got you $2,000. In 2023, that is up to $5,000. So it's a 150% increase in uh, first place. You know, not all of that is attributed to being the Olympics, but I would say some of it has. And in terms of likelihood of it happening, there's two different canoeing events in the Olympics. Uh, the most recent one was added in 1972. I think disc golf is a lot more accessible to the masses than canoeing. <laughs> fair, fair point at the end of the day. No, that it, it is fair to say that um, when a new sport gets added, it does tend to get that. I mean, anytime that, that's a big thing for media to, to latch on to, you know, the break dancing, the flag football, maybe coming next time around, uh, they will at least give it that initial coverage. Um, Lucas, all right, wrap it up for us. What are your thoughts on disc golf at the Olympics? <clears throat> Yeah, I'm going to do kind of the last question first. Uh, I did some research, and the odds of becoming an Olympic sport aren't all that implausible. In fact, there are really just a few criteria that would pose the biggest obstacles. Uh, based on the current requirements that I looked at on the Olympics website, it seems like there are about 35 relatively subjective criteria, including the value added from the sport, how old the sport is, popularity in the host country, production costs, and other things like that. The more objective things that I could find, objective metrics, were that, that has to be played by 75 countries for men, 40 countries for women, and all across three continents. It must be governed by an international federation that oversees the sport and supervises the play and development of their respective sports. 
and adherence to Olympic charter that includes things like non-doping requirements. And so how does disc golf do on that? According to you, disc on 20 in 2023, there are 90 countries recorded. So that's plausible. We do have the PDGA. They would be directly in charge of the event, but they would also have to start doing drug testing, which is expensive <clears throat> and could cause some problems based on what we know about the sport right now. And it would also have to be hosted in a country or region where disc golf uh, has a good course to showcase. So if would it be helpful to disc golf? I think if we look at other examples, we see that it would probably cause the biggest impact in smaller countries. Disc golf has engulfed Estonia in large part due to Kristen. And for an example, outside of disc golf, just look at what Novak Djokovic has done for disc golf, or sorry, for tennis in Serbia. Uh, they were, it wasn't a super popular thing there, but since Novak has started just dominating, it could increase the popularity in smaller countries similar to what Novak has done. Yeah, no, I actually really like that point. Uh, you definitely, you get that effect from the Olympics. There's a lot of small country heroes almost you see in the games a lot of times. Um, so I definitely can see that happen. And yeah, I was wondering if anybody would bring it up because there is criteria that the Olympic uh, sports are supposed to meet. And it does bring a smile to my face thinking about the PDGA being in charge of an Olympic event. Um, that just, <laughs> I mean, wow. Just put them on the, the largest scale imaginable. We got um, rebuttals for this or no? Yeah, you can always rebuttal. All right, first thing rebuttal is for Scott. <laughs> um, I hear this a lot, and and we do this sometimes in disc golf where we're like, hey, the purse went from this to this. That's a blah, blah, blah increase. Scott, if I gave you a dollar, and then a year from now, I'm like, you know what, Scott, you did great. I'm going to give you a 100% increase, and I gave you $2. That sounds really good, but it's a dollar to $2. 2000 to 5000 like that's – that. Uh, to me, that's just, that's just nothing. That's just nothing to like have any sort of like, holy cow, the sport's blowing up $5,000. I mean, I'm ax throwing the winner of the world championship and ax throwing gets $50,000. So yeah. uh, to me, like, I just feel like some of these times people like throwing out these percentages of like, look at the increase. And it's like, I, I'm not impressed. Now, if it went from 2 million to 5 million, now all of a sudden like, okay, that's impressive. Wow. That's a huge growth. 2,000 and 5,000, not impressive at all. Uh, Hunter, also, do you remember when trampolining got into the Olympics, Hunter? Oh, I would never forget. I know. There was so much media about well, it. Like, everyone was talking about it. Hey, was social media around back there, back then? Yeah, it was, actually. When trampolining went into the Olympics? No. sure. What? All I know is Silas and I, I think got it was like towards the beginning of it. Trampolining. <laughs> Trampoline is a pretty old Olympic sport. 2,000. 2,000. I'm pretty so, sure it was like in the beginning of, I'm pretty sure I had a Twitter in 2005. When did Twitter come out? YouTube's definitely was been, it was, it was out by then. Well, I'm just saying, I mean, I think, I think the media quick, landscape's a little different. No, I know what you're I saying. Res, I, 2006. I want to respond to Brody. I agree with you that the increase from $2,000 to $5,000 is not impressive. What does matter is the number of 150%. <laughs> The reality of sport climbers, professional sport climbers competing internationally is that they are completely reliant on their sponsors and in some cases, even crowdfunding petitions from their followers to help fund these events. So to an athlete competing in that sport, an extra $3,000 means that's three more World Cup tournaments I can attend. Oh, I'm not disagreeing you know, with that. In different areas. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying if you took if you took that and someone was like, hey, is rock climbing on the up and up? And you're like, yeah, it's blowing <laughs> up. It grew 150 percent in purses. Yeah. And they're like, really? And you're like, it um, went from two thousand to five thousand. No one's gonna take that. But for the record, trampoline came in, in two thousand. Uh, that's what I said. No two thousand. No that's what I said. Two thousand. Two thousand. Yeah. 2000. 2000. Right? Yeah. No social media. I thought Twitter was around by then. Twitter, Twitter actually uh, was created in 2006. That's crazy. I was born a year after. Uh, it seems like it's been around. Trampoline. But, but I, I don't know. I still don't know if it's a good comparison. Like that's not I, true. I, I hmm? you weren't born in 2001. Year before trampoline. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. I don't. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how good of a comparison though some of these other sports are though because like skateboarding I, to me is like such a huge sport. Like everyone knows about skateboarding, but um, no, disc golf would get like the weird factor. I think it would be like, would everybody, though, look what they put in the Olympics. It, see, that's disc where golf? I know, but it's like people trash on trampolining being in the Olympics. People trash on uh, does. Bre breaking being in the Olympics. I'm wondering like, would disc golf just fall into that? 
oh, this is a stupid sport that got in the Olympics. I hope it wouldn't. Potentially, but those people who think it's stupid are just still not going to play disc golf. I think you you just you kind of they would push, that. but they would push the narrative to a big crowd. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Of where it wouldn't it, chose, it wouldn't get chose, lifted. I chose skateboarding mainly because it was a relatively recent addition, and B, it has a similar thing in like it's trying to get put into public parks. Yeah, but 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 again, the thing is, is like they had Tony Hawk who basically revolutionized the sport. There was a video game yeah. that like ev- no, I never said. Ha- have we all played? Disc golf was the have same we all played Tony Hawk here? here? Has my everyone argument, played the game? My argument was just that Lucas, if I go to a Tony local, Hawk? if I go to a local park, of course I play Tony Hawk Pro Skater. <laughs> no, Lucas has it. Lucas, <laughs> what the heck, and Lucas? They don't, they don't have. He didn't take it with him on his boat. Yeah, that, um, I guess they get <laughs> electricity. Uh, my argument was more if I go to a local parks and rec department. And I'm no, you made a good argument. Yeah. On disc golf, saying it's an Olympic sport, that could have a huge impact. Not necessarily being in the Olympics, but being able to say you, it's an Olympic sport. If you would have gone the argument of like it would have gave a street cred to like the general yeah. public, I would have completely combated yeah. that. But no. going to like a parks and rec person and having it down there, I think you're right. I think that would help kind of push some projects through actually yeah it would be it would just be hilarious if disc golf got shoved into the olympics for one only one LA. olympic games and then like <laughs> the winners that year just happen super random people would just be like hey remember that time that like yesi Niemann won a gold medal like he's, he's like our gold medalist <laughs> it's like because like anything can happen out there um all right on to the next topic here so this is a fan submitted topic um in round one of the lws open missy gannon reported an incorrect score on a hole no one on the card disagreed so the score was submitted after the round as correct um then when the post produced coverage was being put together they noticed the incorrect score and reported it giving missy a two-shot penalty um she posted about this on her instagram story uh so the question here is should video evidence be allowed to use for score verification video replay and pictures are not allowed when determining a ruling or needing clarification from an official um hunter what do you think well so how the, this question kind of worded the situation and how i heard it are two different things and i think it's a really important distinction to kind of figure out here because in, in the question how i kind of interpreted it with this question is that the video evidence was what was submitted to make this call be happened versus what, how I interpreted what Missy posted was she was kind of shown the video evidence and she reported it on herself. Cause yeah. if that's the case where she was shown the video evidence after it was cut, then you can't really do anything about it. Cause the video evidence wasn't what was submitted to make the call. Instead, she was alerted. I understand it was technically what was used, but she was alerted the same as if I would have saw Brody's scorecard after the round. I'm like, Hey, yo, you actually had a, a four here. And then she went and did the right thing. You get what I'm saying? So to me, that's a really important distinction because that is just something where, what are you supposed to do about that? Like she was then made aware of, Hey, I made a mistake. She did the right thing. Went to the PDJ said, Hey, I made a mistake. I actually had this score here. Then she was, a, a you know, two stroke penalty was assessed. How she got that information in this case happened to be video evidence, but I think that you immediately will hear those two and tie them together and think, oh, video evidence was directly used to make this call when was it kind of, but not by the tournament director. So you can't really create a rule like, oh, well, if the video is shown to this person, they can't like that to me, it's because it went to Missy and Missy turned it in. If that's actually how it happened, then there's no way around it. Like it just, it sucks is what it is, but yeah. Yeah, a little bit of an interesting conundrum there, I think. Um, Scott, what are your thoughts on the situation? Uh, my first thought is that I had no idea about that hunter, and I agree that is a very important distinction because when I hear of Missy being found aware of it herself and then following the rules of golf, having that player integrity to go and make on the call on herself – I think that's exactly what she should have done. And that is different than I initially interpreted it. So my initial impression of thinking that video was used after the fact by a tournament official to uh, judge Missy, that is allowed under PDGA rules. The only time you can use video evidence is to evaluate player misconduct. It can't be used on a ruling, but it's listed on their website. It can be used for player misconduct. But we've run into a problem there because what percentage of cards are actually filmed? So only the cards that are actually filmed could ever have this used against them. And for most of the players, it's just not going to apply to them. So in that instance, 
I would say this should not have happened because not all players on the course are filmed and this rule couldn't have been applied to everyone. And yeah. that's all I had. Yeah, no, that's, that definitely is a, uh, always going to be the weird thing with, uh, with video evidence. Uh, Lucas, how do you weigh in on this? Yeah, I do agree that it's like a chain of command issue in terms of like the actual like letter of the law type of thing that Hunter was talking about. But I really think that this question and situation really speaks to two broader issues in disc golf rather than just the situation itself. First, not allowing video or photo evidence is really inconceivably foolish to me. That needs to be changed, I think. Second, disc golfers generally are not good enough at keeping score. So first, the video slash photo or cell phone rule. The first time a card mate told me this rule, I was taking a picture of something to show a TD. He was like, you can't do that. I thought he was joking. Other sports use video review or have a rules official on the whole to help with discrepancies. Not being allowed to use technology to get the best call is baffling to me, and it needs to be changed, I think. I know some people will say that we're all certified rules officials, but just like kind of Ricky and Brody were talking about on Tour Life, a lack of standardization means more gray, area, gray areas, which means we should be allowed any tools necessary to get the right call. With that said, um, in the Missy situation, uh, I kind of agree that it depends on the chain of command, like I said earlier. Second, the scorekeeping itself. Getting to a hole and waiting for everyone to get their phones out and then each individually say three, three. It's ridiculous. It's my probably my biggest disc golf pet peeve. We shouldn't be calling out any scores on the tee box. So you should just keep score. Alternatively, I'll go ahead and predict that Brody's going to make the case for fewer players on the card or only keeping score for yourself and one other player like they do in golf, which are also fine solutions. But keeping score for three other people really shouldn't be that much of a burden. Yeah, yeah, it definitely happens uh, more often than you would think. Uh, some good points there. Brady, wrap it up for us. Uh, what do you think about the the Missy situation? Yeah, just for those that are like confused at to like, oh, well, how how would you do it if how would you do it fairly if you were only keeping your score and someone else's? Everyone gets a scorecard. Okay. It's a thin piece of paper, and you've got one through 18 on the top, and that's where your name is. And on the bottom, you have whoever else in your group that you're keeping score of. So let's say I'm keeping score for Trevor. I put Trevor's name and then all the scores down there. There's a perforated edge already created, perforated line already created. So when we get to hole 18 and we're already done, because I've kept my score, I've kept Trevor's score. All I have to do is I rip that off and I hand it to Trevor. And then Trevor rips his off and he hands it to me. And then I grab it and I put it right underneath my scorecard and I go three, three, four, four, five, five, five. And I go real quick across. It takes about five seconds. Everything's right. Good. We're done. That's all we have to do. I don't know why we're doing all this crazy stuff with the people in the cell phones and all that. Um, the video evidence thing is also kind of weird. Um, but the way that Hunter explained, it, I think exactly is how it happened. It's done. It's, it's been like this uh, before in the past where people have been, uh, made aware of something and honestly it's on them whether or not they want to come forth i think there was a tournament where <clears throat> they actually sent an email <coughs> extension oh no extension <laughs> <laughs> i think there was a tournament where they actually uh you know Get this, when you have paragraphs on how to play every hole differently from the other holes, yeah. uh, people are going to play holes incorrectly. So they found out that a bunch of people, like 10, 15 people, played a hole incorrectly. So they sent out an email saying, hey, if you did this, please come and let us know because you played the hole incorrectly. Now, how many of those people actually came out and said like, oh, yeah, I did do that? Who knows? But – uh, yeah. we, we have seen this in the past, but Hunter is 100% right. Missy didn't have to have, didn't have to say, oh, there's video evidence of my score being wrong. I have to go and as assess this penalty. Uh, she was the one that did it herself. Yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird one because, like, you're right. It's not technically the authorities using video evidence, but as soon as that video evidence is brought to you and yeah. it's known by people, it it's might tough. as well be the same thing. Because, like, you're not, yeah, you got to be crazy to not do it at that point. Um, but yeah, it, it's. I think it's always going to be a weird one because you know, yeah. I mean, you know, Lucas was mentioning if you're in a spot where you feel like you're going to get maybe the wrong call. Um, but you can take a picture and it's right there and it's accessible. Like it, it's tough to feel like I think, that. I think the logic behind like local tournaments and stuff is if you take the pictures at certain angles, it can sway. So like the best people to make the call are the people on the ground. 
Because, like, if I took a picture of a disc from, like, back here looking this way, it might be like, oh, that's clearly in bounds. But then you take a picture from right above, and it's like, oh, that was we definitely just need out to have of bounds. All you know four card mates need to take a picture, I guess. That's what I, was <laughs> I, say, do yeah. think, I do think there should be different rules on how video is used between a local tournament and on the disc golf pro tour. Yeah. Like, yeah, there should be different yeah. rules for how everything is done <laughs> in yeah. a local tournament most, of the pro tour. Most certainly. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. Well, speaking of uh, cell phones and technology, we're going to talk about our next topic. Uh, got a lot of people wrought up, myself included. Um, so spectators for Worlds have been emailed and informed they cannot have their phones while watching at New London and must leave them in their vehicles. Um, now, this <clears> is <throat> done uh, definitely to uh, help their broadcast signal issue. Um but my question here is, is this a necessary evil to ensure the success of the broadcast? Is that the priority? Or is this such a ridiculous rule that the PDGA should just have to deal with their lack of pre-planning? Is this on them? Are they putting too much on the fans? Scott, what do you think? I think that not planning for adequate cell phone coverage at the biggest tournament of the year is embarrassing for the world championships. Uh, I think we've all heard of Starlink. Starlink is available outside of Lynchburg, Virginia, where the world is going to be held. That is one option to add us uh, some more data coverage. But on top of that, fans pay for an experience and they want to take pictures of the event. They want to be able to share that online. And disc golf should want that too. People being excited at an event and posting about it only spreads more awareness you know, if someone's got 100 followers on Instagram, 95 of them probably do not play disc golf. Now, when you look at golf, the Masters in Augusta does not allow cell phone use, usage. That is a very established a turn, tournament, and that is done, you know, out of respect and for the love of the game of golf. I do not think that uh, disc golf is there yet, and I think that we want people to be able to use their phones to share this experience with their followers and the world. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, it definitely uh, definitely inhibits the idea that you can uh, spread the news surrounding the event. Uh, Lucas, what do you think about this cell phone policy? Yeah, I think it really is ridiculous because there are other options that don't involve this extreme solution. I, I think it – because of that and because that it takes away from the natural advertisement that Scott was kind of just talking about, uh, I think that it just is a, like almost an unforgivable mistake. Uh, so first, the other solutions, I brainstormed for 15 minutes and I came up with these three immediate solutions that I think could probably help. Uh, first of all, the PDJ plans ahead more by maybe trying to get a specific sponsor for like a network-based or cellular-based thing. Um, I know that Scott just mentioned Starlink, uh, but I know there's other things out there as well. Second, as you, as other people have said, just ask the spectators to do airplane mode. And then third, uh, maybe get Wi-Fi for the entire course and then charge people to use the Wi-Fi at the course. And that would provide money to pay for the Wi-Fi and then also potentially uh, add more money to the purse, which is always a good thing. Uh, the second, the loss of experience for the fans. Scott touched on that, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But videoing your favorite pro throwing shots is awesome, and depriving people of that at the World Championships is absolutely ludicrous. And then third, the loss of advertisement, uh, which is kind of a different spin on that, the loss of experience for the fans. People taking pictures and posting things is just natural advertising that allows for engagement and letting people know this huge event is going on. Uh, again, Scott mentioned that too. Uh, it's free and you don't have to go pay for it and they're preventing people from doing that. So yeah, it's just not a mistake that should be happening at the biggest event we have. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it feels like yet another shortcoming from the PDGA planning an event. Uh, Brody, what do you think about the, uh, the no cell phone policy? Yeah, I'm going to disagree with Scott. I think, you know, the PDGA is a company that is uh, innovative and <laughs> is looking out for the best, um possible outcomes for their customers and their clients you know we're you know in today's age you know it's disgusting you go to a concert and you're sitting there trying to enjoy it and in front of you you see hundreds and hundreds of cell phones uh you know out in front of you you know i think uh they looked at the masters and saw what the masters was and was like you know what that's what world should be no cell phones no photos no pictures um you can't you can't tell people where you are on the course. You just got to figure it out. Um, you know, I think it's a beautiful thing that the PGA did. 
<laughs> I bet. Is that it? Is that all you got? Yeah, that's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Um, I'll give you maybe a couple points for good satire. Come on, I comedic, guess. Yeah, come on. Comedic <laughs> no, timing. He's a funny uh, guy. Really good. Good satire. That was, a, that was amazing. Um, Be I, the man. Give him one more bonus point. <laughs> nah. Okay. Hunter, go ahead. <laughs> All right, well, look, if we're looking at this as there's two options, right? A necessary evil, or they just have to deal with deal with it, their lack of repanning. I think if those are the only two options, I think it is a necessary evil. Again, that's saying we are acting like airplane mode and uh, going out and visiting the course and trying to get a sponsor. We're acting like all of that's impossible. We're acting like we were dropped in today and we have to make a decision, um, which they weren't. So I don't want to say, sound like I'm letting the PDGA off the hook because this is crazy. We've known world is going to be here for two years. It takes 10 minutes for someone to like figure out, Hey, we should probably figure out how to get any type of coverage out here. But what we have to think through here. Um, and also side note, because I am one of the spectators, it would have also gone a long way. If you realize this problem and just let us know before we paid for our tickets, that would have also been great. Cause then I would have known what I was paying for. Okay. Back into why I say necessary evil is simply because they have to kind of choose between spectator experience on the ground and viewership experience at home is where they're at currently. Right. And so when they're looking at those, they have to cater to the majority, which the majority of people will be viewing this at home. So when they're looking at realistically the two rounds at new London, we're probably looking at 2,500 people on the ground versus thousands and thousands of people, you know, maybe worlds, maybe close to 10,000 people viewing at home. If the 2,500 people on the ground are going to make it, all basically unwatchable for the 10,000 people at home, then sure action does have to be taken, which is why I'm saying it is technically a necessary evil. If you were to drop us in right now and we made all the same mistakes the PDGA made because there was a lot of them. Yeah. yeah there's the, there's no number of scheme to be played. My thing, uh, the thing that cracks me up the most is, and I know people are kind of dropping like the, uh, the master's comp as like kind of a joke, but I really wish they would have Went that tried direction. to just play this off and market it <laughs> as if like a, we want like this experience where everybody is in the moment and we go back in time. So we're going to ask you to leave your cell phones. Cause like, we all would have known what they were doing, but it just been really funny to watch their attempt at uh, marketing it that way. Um, so I wish they would have done it because it would have just been fun. Well, I would be curious, like, cause they've asked people before to go airplane mode, right? Like I, music city yeah. open was an event that I was asked to put your phone in airplane mode. And I would assume that we got to this point because enough people weren't doing it. My next step and someone actually brought this up on a live stream I was doing earlier was is I wonder if they just went above and beyond of explaining why your phone needs to be on airplane mode. Like, Hey, yeah. here's all the technical information you don't actually need to know. So you really understand why we need your phone on airplane mode right now. Like I feel like people are just always gonna be more open to airplane mode than leaving your phone in your car. So it wouldn't surprise me if this is going to go off worse for them than if they it ask will. to put it on airplane mode. Because, because now like, everybody who brings their phone in, mode, but like well, right now, now everybody who brings their phone in, well, they gotta be, be a lot of them. They gotta be checking. They gotta be checking. Who's gonna watch, do that? You think you don't think they're gonna be checking? This is not gonna be good at all if they're not checking. What the heck? <laughs> I, I don't know. They're not, I don't know. They're sure not. I mean, I bet I'm sure you'll get a few. Hey, sir, could you please put your phone away? Situations. Like, it's but, not that hard to get by one of those little uh, metal detector things. Well, they're not and, gonna be metal and detecting just, it out and just warn people. I mean, that's also super safe. That'd be nice. They so did. What? They did say they're going to be doing bag checks, so it could be a part okay. of that. That's process. what I'm saying. Matt, you do a little boop boop bag I'm check. I'm saying because they didn't. They didn't wand at USDDC, did they? I don't believe no. so. They they started bag checking at Music City <laughs> when right. uh, the Natalie Ryan incident went down. Yeah, yeah. So that wouldn't be a terrible. That wouldn't be a terrible thing for them to do. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. It it, it just gets me heated even thinking about it. <laughs> them not letting people take their phones. In I there. also think Hunter, if you like explained it, people would still do it because. I'm pretty sure, like, I thought if you used your phone on an airplane when they told you not to, crash. It, it would crash the plane. It's fear-mongering. We need that's, that. That's yeah. what I thought, and people still did it. So I think yeah. people are still going to use their phone. They probably would. I'm just saying, like, I feel like you get a better conversion rate Oh, I yes. would yeah, I would definitely agree. Use yes. airplane mode, then, oh. hey, leave it in the car. Because, oh, like I 100%. said, right now, I feel like if you let everybody bring their phone in, and you like, let's say you get signage, like you make it like to where everybody's going to see it at some point. Please put your phone on airplane mode. It's communicated to ninety five percent. I would say that 
Heck, I would say 50% of people put their phones on airplane mode. Like, I, it's not a crazy ask. Maybe they take it off at one point to send one text or one call, but then they probably put it back. It's pretty easy to get across. Now, I think you're going to have at least 50% of people bring their phone in anyways if they're not checking, and none of them are going to put it on airplane well, we mode. Had so a, uh, I don't really know what it accomplishes. We had we had a uh, email sent out one time. This was a couple years back of – I think one of the parks or something was like, Hey guys, you can't have dogs on the course. And I guess the pro tour kind of reached out to us as players being like, guys, do not have your dogs on the course. Like the park is telling us you can't have it. And there was like a couple people that were like, we should just all bring our dogs and screw them. And I'm like, <laughs> and what, and what just have the, have the tournament canceled. <laughs> like what, what, what's our point? What's the point? So it's like there's always just going to be people that suck. I mean, people, there's uh, always, always. I want to say uh, one thing to Hunter. When you're talking about the experience for the majority of viewers, I would consider myself in that majority. And I have never watched a whole round of live disc golf. I only watch post-produced coverage. And I do pay for uh, – I forgot the name yeah. right now. D DGN uh, to like watch the European open coverage early and to watch Jomez without ads. So I, I think a lot of, uh, there are a lot more viewers on those post-produced videos than there are on the actual live coverage. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah I'm and just saying, I know ticket sales wise, there's going to be more people watching live than people on the ground. So if like, if you're yeah. sacrificing the live quality for people on the grounds experience, then that's where it's like, well, something's got to be done to cater to the majority. But to be uh, fair, the but, people on the ground also paid a heck of a lot more money. Yeah. But I, the DGN makes more money off of the DGN than yeah. off of an event <laughs> that they're not, that they're just being paid to broadcast. Yeah. Well, this is not a good situation for anyone. Yeah, honestly, it, it, yeah. it, it just sucks yeah. all the way around. It, you well, know, it's fine I, for it, the people at home watching <laughs> Well, yeah, and the, and the best part is the best part is we heard from one of our coworkers that he was out there like testing cell service for them like what a few weeks ago or something like it, this is like yeah people were pretty... they, they were testing it like a month or two ago I think yeah, yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't long ago that's why this email recent. just went out like they <laughs> yeah. just they just found out I think that's that's pretty tough for me to fathom um but you know I get less surprised every day um all right last topic for our final topic here. Um, so this was originally an idea submitted by a fan. Um, I kind of added a little twist to it because I thought of um, kind of thought of a, an extra idea. So hole 16 out of creates an interesting score separation and drama because it is reachable in two, but has some trouble to be found as well. That could punish the aggressive play. So my question here is, is there ever a reason to have a long par four as opposed to a shorter par five? Um, as long as the hole can also punish the aggressive shot. And this is obviously within the sport of disc golf. Um, is there ever really a benefit to have that long par four um, instead of maybe enticing the more aggressive shot, I guess? Uh, Lucas, what do you think? I really can't think of a reason as a player or as a viewer why I would rather see a longer par four than a shorter par five. I just, I think that the shorter par five will just always provide as much drama as a longer par four, even if there's some kind of a force carrier in Island green, because that force carry to get an Eagle, it just, it just feels better as a player and a viewer to get an Eagle as opposed to a birdie. And so when people say that par doesn't matter, I think that there's just a little bit of like short sightedness there because it does matter in terms of what it makes the players feel, what it makes the viewers feel not necessarily as much as in terms of players going for it. I think the tour is so aggressive right now that par four versus five isn't really going to deter most players from going for whatever the best score they can get on the whole is. But I do think that that momentum build uh, of getting an Eagle versus a birdie of clearing and getting to the green versus uh, having to lay up short of it, I think that that momentum shift provides much more drama as a par five than as a par four. Yeah, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely can add a spark to a round, no doubt about that. Um, bro, do you love momentum? So, what do you think about it? Uh, I don't understand this question. Is there There's ever, if there ever is, a, if there is there ever a reason to have a long par four as opposed to a shorter par five? Mm -hmm. So, so they're like, saying you can't, they don't, there's, they're asking, should you have both or should you never have both? If you have a long par four, is there ever a reason? Like it, basically same hole. same hole, it's the same hole. Let's say you like, you have a hole that it would be as a par five, a like reachable par five. 
um, that maybe punishes the aggressive shot. So you're, oh, so now you're just saying changing the par. All you're saying is just make it from a four, make hole 16 a four instead of a five. Right. I'm saying, yeah, so and that would be a bad you, hole. Anytime you have a hole like that, that would be a longer par four. Is there ever a reason to have that hole? So here's the thing. Yeah. You want to have long par fours like hole 16 at Idlewild would not be a good long par four, but there are holes that are good long par fours. Elaborate. So, so well, why? <laughs> so well, so there's two different things. When you play a long par four, there should not be an easy route to get a par. You have to throw a a, a difficult first shot. You have to throw a difficult second shot, and that might give you the opportunity of making a birdie. Now you have to complete two difficult shots. If you if you messed up one of those difficult shots, you're probably in a position to where now you have to throw something really good to save your par. On a short par five, you now have the ability of getting an eagle if you throw two great shots and make a big putt, or you can throw three decent shots and make a birdie, or if you mess up one of those shots, you now are scrambling to make a par. Those yeah. are two different holes, and both of them need to be exist in disc golf. I don't. Okay. Yeah, I don't. Fair. I don't get the question. remember these questions are not my dire opinion. It's just they're just ideas. Well, I don't get this question. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Hunter, pl please, please go ahead. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with Lucas and somewhat agree with Brody. More so that I think I think hole 16 where it brought this question up might not be the the perfect hole for this. Um, but I think there's a lot of holes out there that maybe play as a shorter par five. Um, that could be a longer par four or vice versa. Where I disagree with Lucas is I actually view this as the exact opposite thing. I think that making a lot of them as par fours where they're reachable in two is going to encourage aggressive play a lot more because I think that disc golfers, especially on the tour, you're ingrained to like, you're, you're a birdie machine. You don't want pars, right? So if I'm looking and I'm like, I have a basically guaranteed birdie four, if I were to just lay up, lay up, and then, you know, lay up, tap out a four, I, it's very easy for me to four that very hard for me to three once that switches to a par four and that layup 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 play is for par i feel like you're a lot more enticed to go for it and try to get the birdie three because people are wanting to score they're not wanting to take pars so i think that has to be the the line that people are riding of is this something where i want to force more people to go for the green in two if so in my opinion make that the long par four or if it's something where like this shot is a very low probability it's really challenging but it is doable that's a great opportunity for a shorter par five if that makes sense so i think that both can exist idlewild at 16 i get to brody's point i think plays better as a shorter par five i don't think it'd be a good par four but i think there's a lot of holes out there that this line could be written like that i just think making it a par four actually encourages that aggressive second shot yeah. Is someone else going? Because yes, oh, um, Scott, weigh in on this. <laughs> Poor Brody loses his mind. <laughs> so when I was thinking about this question, I wasn't thinking about it as much from the player's perspective. I was thinking about it from the viewer's perspective, and I think that long par fours and short par fives both benefit the viewer. So me as a viewer, I love watching a player make that eagle like alvin final round making eagle on 16. i was very excited watching that but i also love seeing a player execute <clears throat> two highly difficult shots on a long par four uh because i appreciate the difficulty of it like i think uh when we look at the monster at the european open that course had a lot of very difficult par fours where you could be heavily punished or uh, you could really throw some excellent shots and walk away with a birdie. And I think for the viewer, that was very fun to the walk, to watch. And for a player, that does build that momentum like Lucas was talking about. Maybe not as much as an Eagle 5, uh, but it certainly is a huge confidence boost on an insanely difficult par 4 averaging above par. Uh, so I think that if you are looking for more score separation, you should focus on longer par fours that have the ability to be punished uh, with a bad shot. If you want more excitement at your tournament, you should go for the shorter par five. Okay. Yeah. Brody, go ahead now. You may. Can I say may... something after Brody? Yes. Lucas, you can go first if you want. Okay. If, if you don't care, sure. Um, so kind of both to Hunter and to Scott. 
So I, I was thinking about it in terms of like excitement and scoring separation also. So I, I'm arguing, I think, that there's more scoring separation and more excitement from a shorter par five versus Hunter, you're saying that you think that there's more excitement and scoring separation from a short, a longer par four. No, I agree. Them. I agree on the the excitement on the par five. I was just saying, you're. I think you're going to make more people attack the green in two on a par four because it's for birdie, versus they can lay up for birdie. If that makes sense. Oh, okay. okay. Can I jump in now? <laughs> yeah. You you guys are missing a massive point here, and it's it's the actual hole and how the hole is designed. Hole sixteen, Hunter. No yep. one plays that hole differently if it goes from a five to a four. I said right. it was, I said that wasn't the best hole to choose. But but that but I'm saying you're saying okay, but you just said making making a long par four, you would get more people to attack it. I would bet statistically more people would attempt to reach not drastically more, but I think more people would attempt to reach hole sixteen and two, knowing that's my only way to get a birdie but, versus but everyone is already doing that par. to begin with though. On not that everyone. hole. Yes. Everyone. Yes. Everyone okay. is trying to land it short of the short of the OB. Yeah. And trying to make a 40, 50 foot putt. Everyone. The only people that aren't doing that are the people that like shank a shot like off the tee and are like not but even. There's up some in people a good that are spot. going for the green. No. Is it in a couple yeah. of years no. ago that no. Paul, Paul literally no. threw an OB kind of short right and he still tried to go up to like that 40, 50 foot range? I feel like yes. I remember that yes, happening. Because it's a huge landing area. Exactly. Every, right. Everyone's trying to land I, it there. There I is no risk. 16 isn't the best example. But Hunter, people do Hunter, try to go for that green. Hunter, if if you can if you can find five people that are telling you that they are actually trying to land their disc on that green that is the size of like twenty five feet. I mean, I can find you footage of people going for the green. That doesn't. Oh, so Joey Joey Buckets was trying to make his final shot into eighteen then. <laughs> no, but there's a drastic difference between I'm trying to lay the up short and I'm throwing it deep into those woods. It's a drastic the difference. It's a different shot. Well, what I'm saying, Hunter, is every, that's not that. Uh, everyone hole 16, is just, I said in my argument that that was not that's not a great hole for this this argument. Right, and the question did say, is there ever a time? But it was using hole 16 as the example. I know, but the a lot of people say that as like people are going to play differently if you change the par from four Definitely. to five, and that's yeah. not how it's going to work. No, well, that's like, what hole, I was saying. I don't two. think it will change. No one, no London one would change. Let's London. go. To, yeah. Let's go to hole, hole what? Let's say hole two at New London. It's a really long par four right now. That's if the point I was going to bring up next. People five, would play it a lot safer if you play it as a par five. Yeah. No, people would still go for the eagle if they throw a good drive. Not as often. But, but there'd be a there'd be a large group of people that are like, I can get a really easy birdie here. Why would they not take that? But Versus they also like go for get, the green and might make a might make you a can ball. throw a, you can throw a putter or a mid what, off the tee what, if you're going what are for we, birdie. What are we talking about, guys? A stroke is a stroke. What are we talking about? It doesn't people matter if it's an eagle or bogey. People perceive it different. Yes, bad golfers do, Hunter. Yes, people that people that are bad. A people that are bad golf, do a lot of the disc golf field thinks in birdies. I want birdies. So if you give them, and an I would say those are bad. Par, I would say those are bad disc golf. Well, a lot of people, cause a lot of know. people get to a course and they haven't, they haven't played it or seen how it's going to play out. So the only thing they can judge that hole off of is not what is the field going to do? It's what's the par, what's the birdie. And if the birdie I, is the good thing, that's what they go for. Can, can I give an actual like f facts, like actual facts instead of us just saying like, Oh, this is how I think people would do it. Literally look at hole number, uh, hold on, one, two, three, four, five, hole six. Look at hole six at uh, Ledgestone. Okay, so you have the baseball hole yeah. over the baseball field. Then you have the very difficult par four. Mm -hmm. The amount of people that are playing that hole for par now has risen drastically. When I first played that tournament, so many people were going for birdie. And you know why? Because they've huge... seen the field play it, and they know how it plays now. In relation you, to the field. you know you why? Because change? they're better disc golfers on the course, huh, Trevor. What are we? I'm just, saying, point. I'm just saying, like, if you have all these new players coming to New London, and you made it a par five, and people don't know, or or you, Trevor, you yeah, play that it's... hole a couple times. You play that hole a couple times, and you realize getting a birdie on this hole is very hard if you don't throw a good drive. You might and not. You, these you guys, seen the you're talking about the yet. best disc golfers in. The world. We're well, not talking think, about C tier AMs. What do you think it would do if you made hole six a par five? You think nothing changes at all at Ledgestone? Hole six? Yeah, at, the hole six at par five. At par four, I mean. <laughs> Dang, Zyles. Yeah, Hold Silas, on. what the frick? How hole, fast are hole, you? Hole, no, this par would, four. If you made it, it a par it five, would, you think it, it changes nothing? 
I don't think it would change much because it'd be the same exact thing. You would have people that, that are attacking it for Eagle, and you'd have people like myself that were playing it the same way. Highs or spike, forehand spike, backhand, four, moving on. You don't think I'm it would getting, increase the amount of people playing for four? The only thing I could see it changing, Hunter, is if it's later in the tournament. If it's later in the tournament, but that that wouldn't matter if it's a par five or four. If that hole was later in the tournament, uh, by what I'm saying is if that hole was like 16 or 17, someone that played it for par the first few rounds, I could see them changing their strategy if they need an extra stroke. But I don't see it at hole six. I don't see if you change that to a par five. I don't see everyone all of a sudden being like, oh, wow, I'm just going to do this. Not everyone. What would I, have just, to, I just what think, would have, I think more people would go for the birdie. Why what, would have, what would have to happen is they would have to do something like they did out at European Open, where they actually changed the hole to where they made – you have to make a decision off the tee of do you want to try to clear hole three, hole three, the par five. Do you want to try to clear? No one's trying to clear that and play that for like a birdie. The birdie's too easy just to chip a forehand, chip a forehand, chip a backhand, right? So you make a decision on the tee there. I think you would have to do that at that hole. If you made it a par five, you would have to change it to where players would have to make a decision off the tee of if they're trying to go to the second landing zone or the first landing zone. No one's changing their gameplay on hole six if you made that all of a sudden a par five. No one's doing that. Okay. I agree because of the shot. Stroke the shots is a stroke. Well. Yeah. You're, you're throwing hyzer hyzer, so I think that's probably part of it too. Like we watched Calvin play that hole, and he just kind of throws hyzer hyzer at it. And so I don't think that changes if it's a par five. He's just able to throw two stock shots. I think that's I think the shape of the hole probably matters more than like the the, the whole, par. Whole I've just heard a lot, of, I've heard a lot of really good disc golfers like on tour previously. They might have changed how they think. This was definitely several years ago. I've heard a lot of them talk about, well, this is a par five. I can get a four every time. And then if it were to change, that's yeah, bad I've mentality. Heard, I'm just saying I've heard great disc golfers say it. Yeah. And I think those great difference golfers have gotten smarter because I've played with some and of them. Might have. I'm just saying I've played I've... with some of them at Ledgestone that would normally go for that hole yeah. and they don't go for that hole anymore. Cause they're like, it's, it's not worth potentially taking like a seven. I'm just mm -hmm. going to take my pars every single round. And then move it may, forward. It may be an older, um, you know, an older. That's I think that whole actually needs to change. I think that whole actually um, needs to change because yeah. it's too easy to get a par now. I, I definitely see a lot of, you know, I honestly would, well, this is kind of a justice for par fours type question because I, there's a lot of people who get very attracted to the par fives because of the Eagle opportunities. And it's, I think it's sometimes, you know, I'm more on the side of things where I like to see to golfers good closer to par. Um, but Pres preserve yeah. hole 18, that hole doesn't change either. If it's a par four, no one plays that hole differently. If it's a par four, no one. Oh, I think that hole. Holy people are either laying up or they're That's going right. correct. I, you're, I you're either out of position yeah. and you're laying up short of the of the yeah. OB uh, coverage. Well, at the European and Open, the one they changed to a par five. Do you think people more people are going for that first landing zone to go for the birdie if it's a par four? People changed how they play that hole because of now there's a risk of throwing yeah, OB on your drive. Too. I'm saying if they didn't change the par, if it was a, if they didn't change the par. It was always oh, a par said five. they made it a par five. No, no, hole three was always a par five. They okay. changed, they added Landing OB yeah. to now where players actually had to make a decision. So not everyone, before that, before they add the OB, everyone was just throwing their tee shot as far down there as possible because there was no risk. Yeah. But because they added the OB, now people are having to make decision. Do I just chip a 250 foot shot or do I have to try to throw this tricky 420 foot cover? Um the par, the changing that from a par four to a par five, it, again, it wouldn't. I think even if you change a really, really hard hole to a par three, like that's the easiest way of thinking about it is like make a really hard par five into a par three. Well, no, no that's one, too drastic. Well, it's got to be not. achievable. No, no, no. <laughs> no. My point is people are still going to try to play that hole to score the best that they can score, regardless of what the par is. They're going to say, my skill level, this is the best I can score. That's what I'm going to go. Owen's a perfect example. The reason why Owen is so competitive, even though she doesn't throw far, is she knows certain holes. If she tried to birdie those holes, she could bring in uh, trouble into play. So she just plays those holes for par. It's, she I doesn't even look at smarter, the par. I think it's definitely the smarter way. And that's and I'm saying that's. Uh, I think I think Trevor's right. I think 
back in the idea, like the whole idea of people playing like Iron Man, of where yeah, there's like I'm big. not in keep I'm not in keeping score. I'm doing everything as a par three score. Like that made no sense for me going into golf. It's like there's pars. Why aren't we doing that? I think that mentality is slowly getting phased out, and now we're starting to see. I mean, have you ever listened to Gannon talk about how he breaks down holes? Like these are what kids are talking. These are what people are thinking about now. They're actually like thinking about how to break down a hole versus just stepping up and ripping it. And a lot of that has to do with course design because back in the day, you could just throw your shot wherever and you could still make a par. You could still make a birdie. It didn't matter. Now you do that. You're making a bogey. You're making a double. And on some of these courses, you make a bogey or double. And now all of a sudden you might be out of the tournament. Yeah. I mean, it's a question of psychology. Comment down below. Weigh in. Do you think um, the changing of a par changes the mentality um, significantly of of players and what they're aiming to do? Um, we're going to move on to our final of, of the top players in the world. Sure. Real quick. Yes. Do you guys um, think hole two at New London is a par four or a par five? Par four. It's, par four. it's a four. It's just a, it's hard just a very hard four. You have yeah. to throw a really good. You have to actually throw a really good, challenging tee shot. Well, I will say this with with OB. You could make it would it would be a fine five. I don't think anybody would question it if it were a five. With, that would be with way all too the OB. easy. I think I think a par five. I think oh, I, a hole eighteen with the double OB might need to be a par five. With yeah, OB on that's both actually sides. a bigger question. That, thing is, that hole's a monster with OB on both. Oh, they're sides. doing both OB. Oh on my 18? gosh, it's a oh, monster. Yeah. I like that. that. It takes away the it takes Pause. away the rollers. Nobody's yeah. gonna nobody's gonna three it though. That's my problem. I don't think I don't anybody know, will ever three I don't know it. If people are going because it's hard to get aggressive on the drive. So why why that hole I think is bad now is because. Because now there's, like you said, I don't, I don't think there's gonna be that many threes, and so majority of people are gonna go putter, 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 par, and end it, and so the score separation is gonna be terrible. Yeah, I think, Luckily, I think it's it's hole eighteen a day three, not final day. Because yeah, I, 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 I would move that tee bad back like an extra couple hundred feet and make it a par five. Yeah, you, 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 you got to go back or up one of the one of the back two. or up. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You got to make um, it to where a drive can get past those trees for sure. Yeah. For yep. sure. Um, all right, we're gonna move on to our final topic here. We've got a uh, Hunter and Lucas. Um, you guys are tied up right now, so I'm thinking of a number between one and ten. Hunter, take a guess. Two. Lucas. Um, you do dirty here. <laughs> yeah. Three. Did you hear me? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I didn't. Three. Yeah, that's the right. That's the right choice. I. It was six. So. <laughs> Hunter, Hunter had uh, the two out of two out of ten chance there. Um, I was just trying to like, lock in. I thought I thought I nailed you. Would you like to go uh, first or second, Lucas? Uh, I'll defer to Hunter. I'll let him go first. Okay, he he gives Hunter the ball. Um, now this is uh, this is a mouthful. So, but you know, just hear me out. Uh, so Ryan Mon recently came under fire on social media after winning his third amateur major of the season, completing the um, what they're calling the Am Slam. Commenters were disgusted that he stuck in the AM division while winning many MPO tournaments and dominating the AM scene since the beginning of the year, claiming he is sandbagging and should <laughs> and should have moved up sooner. Should the MA1 division implement any kind of restrictions in the future other than the acceptance of cash to protect any notion of a below pro level division structure? Um, what purpose do you think this division serves and why do you think there's been so much outrage surrounding it? Uh, Hunter, go ahead. Yeah, no, I don't I don't think MA1 needs a change. In my opinion, it's the highest level of amateur competition that's out there. So as long as someone to will is willing to stay an amateur, they should be able to compete in that division. It's just that simple. If you're upset at this, don't get bitter, get better. Um, I can understand the frustration around someone playing down, right? Like playing down to MA2 or down to MA3 just to get wins. I get that. I get where people get frustrated there. Um, but when people are getting frustrated just because a dude – is winning multiple amateur majors, one of them being junior worlds. So one of them, half the people who are upset aren't even qualified to play in because you got to be a junior to play in it. Uh, like, it's just crazy to me. The The restriction on staying in the am field, there is a restriction there, right? Like you, you just, you can't accept cash. You have to stay an amateur. That's a pretty big restriction because I don't really know too many people that are playing local MPO scenes and mopping the floor with them, right? That would rather have like plastic than cash. Like the majority of people would re much rather have cash, but they turn it down because they want the chance at these am major titles. So why are they playing MPO then? Great question. I'm glad you asked. Well, it's because the best level of competition available to them regularly is their local MPO scene. And that's, what's going to help them prepare the most 
for their end goal, which is all, which is these AM majors. So they play MPO because they want to go against the best people that are available to them regularly. And then, you know, in preparation for this, the other thing too is 95% of the time, and Ryan Mon is one of these people, once you win these AM majors, that's it. Like that was your goal. That's what you were working towards. And now you're ready to move up. That's what you were like here for. And he said that, like, I won it. I'm ready. That's my last amateur tournament. So people who get upset at this, like you're literally just upset because the guy beat you. And this time the kid beat you. And like, that's, that's all it is. So I, I, it gets me worked up because like MA one exists to be the top of the amateur ranks. What <laughs> is an amateur? Someone who hasn't made money yet. So turning down cash, he is subjecting himself to being an amateur. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, they're fired up. They're fired up. Lucas, uh, what do you have to add? Yeah. I think this has been kind of a problem in disc golf for a while now. Like even people in MA three and MA two are having this argument. Like we, we have um, for those divisions, I think it's even more egregious because you are, you have a rating cap. Like there, even though ratings aren't great, we all know that there is still an objective measure to determine whether or not you can play in this division. And I've heard people complain since I started playing disc golf, Oh, this guy is sandbagging. He should play up. He's not sandbagging because the definition of sandbagging is not applicable here because we have an objective measure that tells you where you should play at based on your PDGA rating. I think the same thing goes for MA1, but instead of the rating, again, 100 mentioned, it's this cash. Amateur division is there to develop players to be ready for the pro field. And it Thankfully, they haven't limited those players from playing in pro tournaments. They just limited them from accepting cash. And Ryan beat me in an A tier this year. He's already won an A tier, and he's declined cash in that A tier. So it's not like, again, he's making a sacrifice here to, to refuse accepting money to play on these amateur tournaments, the AM Worlds, the AM US Championships, and the AM Junior, because there is a very defined, even, even if it's a little bit less developed than other sports, there's a defined amateur to pro status, and that's been winning AM Worlds and winning the AM Majors for a while now. And so since he's done that, he now has a very direct line to manufacturer sponsorships to uh, um, uh, do they still reward pro? I know they wrote the, the tour cards for um, the NADGT series. They might, I don't know if they do that for the majors or not, but now he has possibly entry into other fields because of winning these. And so because he's an amateur and he hasn't accepted cash, he's made that sacrifice. It's allowed him to get a leg up before he moves into the pro field while still allowing him to have that competition with really good players who can challenge him still. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, uh, the biggest disconnect is people hear amateur and they just think less than pro when yeah. realistically the actually the separation is for pay and not for pay and the protected am divisions are a completely different thing than ma1 birdie's turned himself upside down can we go into the floor window yeah what, what happened <laughs> um yeah i think you guys yeah, i feel uh, like i should have been in that final I'm not gonna lie could i could i say one thing yeah uh Actually, Ryan no, you competed, can't. <laughs> he competed in three Elite Series Pro Tour events before he played the Amateur Disc Golf World Championship. He also has four sponsors already. Uh, it does seem strange for someone to be able to play in a Pro Tour event in the first place and then go play the Amateur World Championship. Can I one up you? Money. Can I one up you? Yeah. You know what's even crazier is if someone plays in a major championship and then can play in amateur events. Because you know what other sport allows that? The one that our sport was created after. He's off. <laughs> I can't take him seriously. I know. Why is he um, you guys both covered that uh, topic pretty well. I think uh, Hunter going first just had a little bit more to spit out first there. Um, the bold play on the defer, though. I, I'd always respect the defer. Um, good performance, though. Thank goodness. You're, wait, <laughs> Silas flipped him. <laughs> oh, Silas flipped him. Yeah. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Got him again. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> Oh man, always getting the great special effects. Oh, now you're now you're just mirrored. There we go. Oof, that was ever man. If you ever look at your face like the opposite direction, you look so like unfamiliar. Um, anyways, before this gets any further out of hand, Hunter, congratulations, you're a winner. Uh, you were a few minutes late. I should just dock you a few points for that, um, but I, I won't out of the goodness of my heart. 
Yeah, I mean, look, last week I I was I was fighting an ankle injury. Uh, <laughs> ankle injuries back this week. I lost a toenail. Um, same foot. So tell the people what shirt you were wearing when you hurt your ankle. Man of the people. I was wearing the man That's of the right. people shirt. Yeah. Brody Smith broke my ankle. You heard it That's here right. first. Um, Brody but Smith quick and recovery there. You know, hopefully, hopefully quick recovery. <laughs> I, I don't know what shirt I was wearing when I, I that shelf came out of nowhere and broke my broke my toenail off. But here we are. <laughs> I don't know why it's making me laugh so much. Dang. <laughs> it's just a light. Um, anyways, I, that is really getting me. Um, if you want to submit any topics for debate night, I got to stop looking at it. If staring you contest. S- Trevor, staring <laughs> contest. I can't do it. That's making me laugh so much. I just look up. I have this big monitor. I just look up and I see this giant light coming from where Brody's face should be. It's, it's really getting me. Um, somebody needs to make a, make a, that needs to be a gift. Um, if you want to submit any topics for debate night, you can scan the QR code on the screen. Um, maybe just cover up Brody's face with that. And, um, you can also click the link in the description and love reading the topics. We have a ton of submissions. I think I, we have around 214 for the year. Yeah. So everybody keeps rolling them in. Appreciate it. I always look through them. Um, so keep doing that and uh, we will see you next week. We're getting close to worlds. So next week's episode will be kind of a, a world's preview. I think I'll um, be in studio. I'll say in person. Yeah. In studio. Oh gosh. Yeah. Just I go think head, about head that. gloves off. Might have to. Yeah. Might to. Maybe do we finally get Yuli on debate night? Ben, oh, we could do it. Robbie all... will be in town too. We could do like, we could do, Oh, we could do like <laughs> a team debate night. Team what? debate night. I call Yuli. We oh, could do team gosh. debate night. That could be electric. There's, there's definitely a possibility. So you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, tune in next week for debate night. It's going to be great. A lot of people in town will see you then. Can I? Wh-